Okay, this is meant to be a short tutorial on how to digitize the correlation of map units in ArcGIS. Um, so, one of the th comments I'm going to make right off the bat is please forgive my scratchy voice. I have been fighting off a cold for a while, and uh, I really wanted to get this video recorded sooner rather than later, and since I had an opportunity to do so, I decided now would be the time to get this video recorded. Um, one of the things that I'm going to do is make an assumption that you already have a project set up, that you're already in the process of working on the map, and that potentially you have already hand-drafted a correlation of map units. And the reason why I'm making that assumption is because it's a little easier when we're hand-drafting them or however you create your correlation of map units from the beginning. It's a little easier to use um, analog methods or some people use Excel spreadsheets. Um, to be able to move your cells or your um, units around as needed, um, especially as you're developing your map uh, from the beginning, units may have to move age-wise, and then as you get uh, radiometric dating back and stuff like that, you may find that you have to edit where your units fall uh, geochronologically. So I'm going to assume that you're mostly working with getting this set up in the method of your uh, preference uh, from the beginning and then we'll just be digitizing it into ArcGIS. And one of the other addendums and assumptions that we have to make is that uh, the correlation of map units does not physically exist in XYZ space and since Arc only handles XY and a pseudo Z uh, we've got some other difficulties dealing with that but we're going to go ahead and digitize it in space like it exists on the globe recognizing that this is fully incorrect. But part of the reason why we do this is because then when we go to package this um, layout uh, as a map package, our correlation of map units uh, data frame actually needs to have a coordinate system. Otherwise, it throws a warning and uh, will not allow us to package that. So that's one of the reasons why we go ahead and have this. Now, one of the other statements I'll make is that we need to go ahead and do some work up over here to get pointed to the correct you know, database and name some things, etc. But if you're working with the NCGMP09 GEMS data model and you're working for the Bureau of Geology, New Mexico Bureau of Geology, you probably have some of these things already set up. But I want to go through the process of just getting this um, a little more aligned from the beginning, sort of a start to finish process. And I probably won't go all the way to finish, uh, but what I will do is go over some of the basics and some of the things that we see happening um, that need to occur in correlation of map units. And maybe this will also help you understand the process for digitizing a geoletic cross section too. There isn't much difference between the two of them. We're talking about pseudo space anyway, and um, Digitizing in the intent of the correlation of map units and the cross-section is what is important. Unlike the map, we're actually making sure that the location information is 100% accurate. Um, you know, the correlation of map units and geologic cross-sections don't have that same kind of fundamental XYZ space uh, parameter um, for accuracy and precision. So, right off the bat, one of the things that we do when we add in that layer file is it comes in as a generic file. We'll call this white rock CMU. Make sure that you point this to the default geo database and then go ahead and save a layer file just right off the bat so that you have it to work with in your right white rock in your quadrangle map location uh, in map elements. So I'm going to go ahead and save that. And then the other thing that we know is that if we've made this from uh, analog method or some digital method that's uh, more preferred and most other methods are a little bit better preferred than trying to digitize this or build this straight in ArcGIS. Um, you will probably have some image associated with that. So if you've created this in Adobe Illustrator, for example, you'll have something you'll have to export as a TIFF or a uh, JPEG or something like that so that you can actually get this imported into ArcGIS. So this is the um, correlation of map units as digitized or as um, delivered. And what I'm going to do is go ahead and convert this into a um, ArcGIS product in the GeoDatabase. 
So I export this as a TIFF, and then we'll go ahead and load this TIFF into Illustrate, uh, ArcGIS. So one of the other comments that I'll make is notice that our data frame is locked right now, currently at map scale 1 to 24. And that's so that all of our data frames can be put at 1 to 24K, and we know that everything will fit and be scaled appropriate for our um, map. It'll, it'll be in the same scale so that there isn't size variation issues from data frame to data frame. So along those same lines, since this data frame is locked, our correlation of map units data frame is locked, let's go ahead and make a map boundary rectangle to begin with so we have some reference point that we can work with in our um, correlation map units data window data frame so i have created that box and there it is and the reason why we do this is because it allows us to georeference to something that is already square and our rotation angle isn't set to anything and it means that when we do delta x and y and you'll see that process in the future uh, in a little bit uh, things align oriented north south easy it makes things square and look nicer than when we actually export this or, or uh, package this uh, as a map package so one of the things that we can do now is let's switch to data view and then we'll see that our box appears And we can't zoom in and out, so what we need to do now is unlock this map scale. So if we come to the correlation of map units, you can double click or right click in properties, come to the data frame tab and remove the fixed scale and switch to automatic scale. And this allows us then to zoom in and out. So I'm going to zoom to this corner for the time being. And what we're going to do is we're going to start here and I'm going to geo reference to this corner. Let's add in our correlation and map units, TIFF. And normally a dialog box will pop up that says this has no spatial reference. This one didn't because I had already kind of done this process. So we'll make sure that we're geo-referencing the correct TIFF image and we'll start adding in control points. And I'm gonna try and be as close to the center of this corner as possible. And snap it to that. And then I can come to this corner and do the same process. Okay, so now that we've geo-referenced our um, TIFF from Illustrator or whatever method we have digitized that from, we'll go ahead and add in the rectified image. And here we can see now that the box that I drew is a little too big compared to the correlation of map units that we have to digitize. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and resize that so that it's not oversized. And again, this is just a guide to get me roughly where I need to be for digitizing the correlation of map units. It doesn't have to be precise. I'm just making it so it's um, a little easier to work with and a little uh, more appropriate for what I'm actually working on. So I'm going to go ahead and save those edits. And now we have the ability to go ahead and georeference this in our um, correlation of map units feature data set and we'll be at an appropriate scale when we look at this in layout view and set our scale to be 24,000. We'll see that this will actually show up at a reasonable size. And that's because we georeferenced it to some known dimension, which this box is already preset up for. So I'm going to start with our uh, age range brackets, and I'm going to do a contact. And one of the things that I'm going to comment on is I'm going to do it a certain way, and this is the best practice that I have come up with. You may have some other method of doing it, but the biggest thing that I try and work 
from mostly is trying to make sure that all of these elements are square. So I'm going to go ahead and click my first component and now I'm going ahead and digitizing a contact in. And what I'm going to do is there's a few steps here instead of making this break and making this box all by itself I'm going to go ahead and make this whole thing and I'll split this later so that I have a age range that is perfectly square. So I'm going to come down here and I'm going to right click and I'm going to use my delta x y function so that I can set my x to zero so that there's no shift left to right and then that parameter is fine as is. I hit enter and now I've got it to where this line is perfectly square. And I repeat that process for this part as well. Come roughly to where you think it should be, and you can look at the anti-aliasing of your line. So here we've got lots of steps in this line, and here we don't see any of those steps. That gives you an idea of how close you are to square. Right click again, use my delta xy. That dimension is fine. Enter my y, because I'm now going left to right as zero and hit enter and that locks that point into roughly being square. I'm going to do the same for up here. And the same for here. And now I'm going to start using the hotkeys, just so you know. So if you don't see me right click and pull something up, that's because I'm using the hotkeys for this. So roughly square and centered. That's good. That's good. And then for this one, because this is going to be about the point that I start closing my box, I'm going to go ahead and make it too long, and you'll see why here in just a second. And I'm going to finish this, and then I'm going to come back to here, snap, and make it too long as well. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to shorten these so that they're square. And the reason why we do this is because if you try and make this square and line up perfectly horizontal with this endpoint, you'll struggle to do it almost every time. So it's easier to go ahead, make the line a little longer than you need, and then trim it back down to be square. And now we can see that we've got the line that is the start of our uh, age scale. Okay, so like I said, I'm going to break this part into two segments because we have a scale change here. So much like we did previously, I'm going to go ahead and click here. Again, extend too far. Use my delta xy. Edit my vertice so that it snaps and is at the intersection and is horizontal. And I'm going to repeat that process for this. And then now that I've got this line, I can cut this and this segment into two segments so that we can remove this portion of it. So we'll use the split tool. Split there, split there, select this segment and delete it, and repeat that process for this segment right here. And now we've got our segment split in, and these boxes are perfectly aligned to one another, 
and I'm going to do the same thing for a center line down here. We can see that there's a little bit offset between these two lines. So I'm going to remedy that much like I did previously. So I'm going to snap to this segment. Extend a little too far, use my delta xy, make my x left and right zero, finish that sketch, edit the vertices to draw this vertex back towards the box. And now we've got perfectly square things. Now, there's more that we can do with this, and I'm going to skip that process because we're going to do something similar over here with our correlation map units. Once you get the idea of this, you can just go through the process of uh, creating all of these elements as need be, like splitting the early to middle, middle to late, etc., etc., Pleistocene uh, from Holocene, uh, and then we'll talk about how to get in our age points. But I want to talk about this part right here. So to get things nice and lined up, we can go ahead and start creating grids and then split things as we do previously. That's one method you can do things. It gets a little tricky with all of our age ranges uh, as we come, as we get older in age. Um, you know, all of these things stagger left and right. But we can get our vertical set up pretty well from the beginning. Now, if you're using a program like Illustrator or something like that, you can align these from the beginning and not have any problem. And I know these are. So I'm not going to worry about that too much. But one of the things that we can do to speed this process up for our individual boxes is instead of constructing line segments, we can now go ahead and actually construct rectangles. We could have done that over here, but because I had this jog, I knew it would be a little bit easier to do it the other way. And again, I'm just trying to show you a whole bunch of different methods or possibilities so you can find the one that works the best for you and adapt it to what you have on your correlation map units or your cross sections. So right off the bat, I'm going to go ahead and get this as best as I can. And now we're drawing a rectangle, looking for the anti-alias to disappear. Or we can again do a right click into a direction. I'm not going to worry about that too much, but let's show. So if we're doing zero degrees, we then have our box that's perfectly zero degrees. And now because we're using a rectangle tool, when I create this, we have a perfectly nice rectangle. And then there's all sorts of things we can do. We can copy this one, and paste it, and slide it over, and go ahead and break it into segments for this stack right here, et cetera, et cetera. But now you can see how I go ahead and make a whole bunch of different boxes. We can do the same for this one, make a rectangle, split it down the center, it's not that big of a deal. Now remember, this is not a polygon, this is a rectangle. And yes, this looks like a polygon tool, but because we're drawing lines, we're actually drawing rectangles, not polygons. We're drawing rectangular line segments. Okay. So let's do one of these where we can talk about splitting it in two, much like we would over here. So I'm going to zoom in. I'm going to use my rectangle tool. I'm going to click my point. I'm going to zoom out. I'm going to come across. And I'm again going to use my direction tool. We're going to make that zero degrees. And then I'm going to drag it out to be the appropriate size. Click my final click. And then much like we did previously over in the age range. And the nice part is I can snap to that midpoint, bisect these two perfectly in half. Now I didn't use delta x, y, I didn't do any of that, but because I'm bifurcating this perfectly evenly, we can use our midpoint snapping tool as long as the midpoint snapping is enabled. Click my line segment, hit F2, and that line segment is done. Okay, so now that we've gone in and digitized some of the boxes. Let's go ahead and look at, I may have loaded in the wrong correlation of map units.
Yeah, I believe I did. Now, that's unfortunate, but uh, nonetheless, the principle is still the same. We should have in our generic points. So let's let's try something really quick. So bear with me for a second while I get this loaded in. Let me take a look at what we have here. Yeah, unfortunately, I have goofed up, but normally this correlation of map units will be the right one. So let me get this corrected, and then we'll be back in just a second. And now, because of the power of video editing, a second has lapsed, and we now have the correct symbols for each of our, uh, correct template for each of our um, age ranges that we're going to digitize. And you'll see that in CMU generic points, we have one called age. And that is the correlates to the numeric age over here. And with snapping enabled, we can go ahead and click right at the location that we want to have this and click our control point. And then what we can do is switch to the attribute and go ahead and put in under our label a zero and we'll see that that zero shows up. Now, one of the things that I need to do is set up some of the parameters of this to be transparent. And let's go ahead and make our reference scale be 24K like it will be. And we see now that our point now looks like it should. And there's a little bit of offset in that point, so I'll need to correct that in the template so that it lines up correctly. But we can now do the same thing for this point right here. And I'm just going to go ahead and cl keep clicking through adding in the vertices that we need or the points that we need to show the tick marks of age. And then what I'll do is I'll go ahead and correct the spacing of the and the alignment of these ticks. save our edits and let's get the alignment of these set up so if the alignment of these happens to be off 
easiest way to correct this is go ahead and click on the H symbol itself. And we'll see that we can edit this symbol and adjust the offset of that symbol. So I'm going to go ahead and start off by moving it down. Let's look at 0.25. Okay, so probably 0.5 is appropriate to move it down. And unfortunately in ARC we have to click through everything to click apply so that we can see our change actually happen. There, that is much better. And one other statement I was going to make is uh, for this point, the three million year one right here, I'm going to go ahead and remove that label. That label isn't really necessary when we have the 2.58 right here. So I'm going to select that one and remove the label for it. And then that's all. All that is remaining is the tick point itself. We also have a heading symbol as well, and you'll notice that no point is associated with it. Uh, no point symbol is associated with it, but it'll allow us to go ahead and digitize in headings like sedimentary rocks. Pyroclastics. And that's how we can get headings and labels in. And one of the things that we'll have to do is adjust the size of these and the separation of these so that it's uh, evident that pyroclastics is a subheading of volcanic rocks. But we can do that cartographically. But just to get them digitized, this is probably the best way and easiest way to get them um, input into our correlation of map units. And if we wanted to, there's some alignment things that we could do to make sure that these are perfectly uh, horizontal and all of that stuff, much like we did with our boxes and everything. But for the purpose of this, we can do that cartographically later on. It's a little easier to do later on than it is to try and do it in here. It's possible we can do some copy and pasting and moving and things like that. Um, so that is a possibility, but I find it to be a little bit tedious and a bit of a pain in the butt. But we'll try and do a couple of those with these right here. So let's go ahead and... Put in that. Let's put in a, um, uh, a series age here that represents the Holocene. And the Pleistocene. And that is to show how we use these types of things. And then uh, I don't have a stage here, but if we wanted to, we could go ahead and duplicate our um, series. And make this warning me that it will not draw, we can go ahead and put in late and middle. 
and we can now see that they're not labeling or anything like that. So let's go ahead and get them added in to our generic points. This also may be a better thing to actually put in map unit points is another thing to keep in mind. So we'll add the value for stage age, remove the symbol altogether. And add in the stage age class where the type is stage age and then we'll set this up to be a more appropriate thing a more appropriate label let's make that And now we have our, our um, a, a stage labeled as well. And now that we've got that corrected, we can go ahead and continue adding in as needed. And I make the statement that it might be more appropriate to go ahead and add these points into our map unit points because we might want to have these actually build polygons and color these polygons. Uh, we don't necessarily have to, but I tend to like them colored in. So these would be that quaternary yellow. These would be that quaternary yellow. Um, uh, when we got down here to the Pliocene, they'd start getting to be that tertiary uh, orange tan buff colors, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Yeah, and then any of these volcanic should be that volcanic color. Uh, so they should be those highly saturated reds, oranges, and violets, uh, purples. Um, so that may be a better way to handle this. I'm going to duplicate what is done here. So my uh, map units will get labels here in map unit points. But my uh, generic points, this age bar over here, is going to go ahead and get uh, labels added like this. And then in the designer program, we can rotate these the right way and we can rotate these in arc. I'm not going to go into the process of doing that. I more wanted to talk about digitizing of these units. So speaking of adding in map unit points, we'll go ahead to map unit points. We have some already pre-built for us to use. I do not see that specific one. Here, so I'm not going to worry about it. We'll just go ahead and we'll. Um, and here is an example of those um, being digitized in as map unit points in these age blocks. Um, so here are some of those map unit points as an example as well. And if I'm not mistaken, they are set up very similar uh, to a map unit. So one of the things to pay attention to is how this gets set up so that when these polygons are made, they're made appropriately for um, the type they are. Um, as it is, I'm just going to make um, polygons from these lines and I'll just make these clear. I'll just make them hollow boxes. Okay, so let's go ahead and make a TTCU. I'm going to copy one. I'm going to open the properties, the template properties of that. And we said TTCU, TTCU.
And now we have our template set up and we put a point in here. And then we'll do the same process for this one. Okay, and that generically um, basically sums up how to create a correlation of map units. One of the other things that we could do here is go ahead and in heading, you know, put in our scale change labels here and things like that. It's another um, thing that we can do really quickly. But for the most part, that should give you the general gist of how we go ahead and put in most of the components that show up on a uh, correlation of map units. One of the other statements I will make is if we had some um, geochronologic information or something like that, in generic points we should probably go ahead and put in a radiometric symbol or something like that. And then we can go ahead and directly add into our unit a generic label, a label that will give the uh, radiometric age of that. So if um, uh, this intrusion or um, this pyroclastic flow, uh, this pyroclastic flow or this pyroclastic unit had an age associated with it, we could put it timed to our scale over here, a label that shows that, you know, the methodology, if it was argon, argon, potassium, argon, etc., and the age then associated with it, including the plus or minus, we can go ahead and put that in here as a star showing that there was a radiometric age of this unit and um, what age it also corresponds to. So that's the basic gist of this. If you have any questions, feel free to email me, phil.milleer at nmt.edu. Thank you very much for your time and thanks for following along.